All right, welcome back to the Modern Times podcast. Uh, it's Nigel again. I got a little one-on-one interview with historian David Keane of the SNA Niles Film Museum. He's written a book. I don't know how, how long was it? Five, six years ago? Two thousand and three. Two thousand and three. A little longer than that. Yes. That um, covers the history of the SNA studio and uh, what happened to it. And now he's the curator. Is that a good word? Historian. I just refer to myself as historian. Gotcha of the SNA Film Museum, Silent Film Museum in Niles, which is a wonderful place. And any Chaplin fan, it's a place you need to to check out because uh, there's a lot of history here that we'll get into. But first I want to get into a little bit of the history of the SNA studio, uh, where it came from, how it was uh, put together, and who created it. Okay. SNA Studio was formed in 1907 in Chicago by two people, George Spohr, who was the S of S- SNA, and Gilbert Anderson, who was the A. George Spohr was the money person. Gilbert Anderson was the creative person. And they started out making comedies and uh, was soon known as the House of Comedy Hits. At least that's how they advertised themselves. Um, and it wasn't until Anderson started going west beginning in December of 1908, that uh, he uh, started making westerns. He'd done that before that time when he was working with the Sealing Polyscope Company in 1906. And of course he was also in The Great Train Robbery in 1903 for Edison. So He's the guy who gets shot. Yes, right? he, he gets shot in the back. He's also a guy who walks into the dance hall and uh, the and the guy shoot at his feet and he dances. Uh, he was also one of the robbers at the beginning of the film that uh, go into the station and he's the guy that knocks the station agent out with his gun. Now for people that may not be familiar with Bronco Billy, he was what you would say was the first screen cowboy, first Hollywood cowboy, not necessarily from Hollywood, but when you think of a Western and you think of cowboy films, uh, the films that Bronco Billy, G.M. Anderson made uh, for SNA were essentially the origins of all that. What we think of the horse and the rolling hills and... Yeah, he was uh, the guy that uh, people first recognized and knew by name as uh, a Western cowboy star. And a lot of Chaplin fans uh, may not be 100% up to date on, on Bronco Billy, outside of perhaps just his involvement with the SNA company um, and the fact that he hired Charlie sight unseen pretty much. Anderson knew about Charlie and, uh, and, and was, I'm sure, informed by Jess Robbins, who had been Anderson's cameraman for SNA for several years while they were on the road. Jess Robbins was actually Working in, in Los Angeles at that time, he'd left the SNA studio in Niles to form his own movie producing company, which wasn't going all that great. And Robbins heard that uh, Chaplin's contract was coming up for renewal at Senate, Keystone's film company. I think he must have talked to Anderson because, um, at least in later years, Anderson said that uh, he he thought that Charlie was being wasted at Keystone, and that uh, SNA could do more for him and uh, and make some money besides. So, uh, Jess Robbins was actually the person who negotiated the contract with with Chaplin, and uh, introduced the ten thousand dollars signing bonus. But Anderson was the one that had his lawyer draw up the contract and actually sign with SNA. There's a reason why Bronco Billy isn't as famous as he should be nowadays and as iconic, and that's because many of his films don't exist anymore. Uh, Most of them, right? That's right, yeah. The majority are gone. Or Certainly, uh, things keep turning up, but uh, the percentage is rather slim, just as it is with most short films that were made in the silent days. Um, You in particular have... uh, sort of reintroduced Bronco Billy and a lot of the SNA stars that have been forgotten by a lot of people uh, through your book and through, which is Bronco Billy and the SNA Film Companies. That's, That's the right. correct title, right? Yeah. 
which is obviously that book is still available. And uh, but through that book and through the museum, you've been able to reintroduce people to these film stars that because their films have deteriorated and, and disappeared over the years to bring back an appreciation for those people and it's it's definitely a successful venture because a lot more people know about Bronco Billy and about a lot of the SNA stars because of that book and because of the exposure that uh, the Niles Museum gives to things like Charlie Chaplin Days and Bronco Billy Film Festival and uh, SNA Lost and Found so much has been forgotten, so much has been lost, um, and that's true with most of the early pioneering silent era studios. You know, there were big companies that were operating, making thousands of films, literally. Uh, SNA made just over 2,000 films from 1907 to 1918, and, you know, Vitagraph made at least 3,000, um, and there were other companies that... Uh, directors and actors who have been forgotten because uh, so much of their work has been lost. Uh, the only person that didn't seem to suffer as a result of uh, that kind of thing was D.W. Griffith, and most of his output survives. He, w he was the big name that's been remembered, but uh, at, kind of at, at the expense of all the other people who contributed during that time period as well. And Charlie survives because his films got copied so many times and reissued so many times. There was always a copy of something available somewhere. And he was a star for a long, long time. He, you know, he survived the talkie era and uh, continued to make films, although at a slow pace compared to many other people. You know, his la name lives on because he had such a long career and so many people were impressed by his work, yeah. just like Griffith. That's just a few examples of who survived when there's thousands of people who have been forgotten. Now, what are some of the films that you've had a hand in uh, rediscovering and restoring and bringing back out to show to the public? Um, well, here at the museum, um, we've uh, done a, a few restorations. Our first one that we got a National Film Preservation Foundation grant for was Versus Sledgehammers, which was a Snakeville comedy made by SNA here in Niles. Snakeville Comedies was the brand of comedy that was right. Yeah, yeah. just like the Keystone Cops and uh, things like that. Gotcha. Uh, they had a made-up town of uh, Snakeville, Arizona, and uh, they produced over a hundred of these snakeville comedies. Again, though the uh, survival rate of those is very low, about 10%, and uh, so we were able to actually find two different prints of that movie, combine them together to make one complete copy, and uh, we restored that one. How did you get into all this? How did you discover film history, silent film, and, and end up at the Niles starting up the Niles Museum out here? I know it's a loaded, <laughs> it's a, a loaded it's question. It's a long <laughs> answer to that. Um, I was always interested in silent films, even as a little kid. Um, I remember seeing a series in uh, the late 50s, early 60s called Silence, Please. That, I think, was probably my first introduction to silent films. And later on, Fractured Flickers, which you know, made fun of silent films in a way, but uh, but I was interested in them regardless of, you know, I thought they were funny the way they uh, handled the, the sequences, but I was also intrigued by the films themselves. And, uh, you know, when I was uh, just a kid, in, in those days you could buy 8mm films in drugstores and... Uh, and I bought some and showed them on my father's 8mm projector to the kids in the neighborhood. And, and I didn't even know who these people were. And one of them was uh, Buster Keaton and the Blunatic. Just 100-foot cut-downs of, uh, of the full two-reeler, so it, it didn't even tell the whole story. And there was one with uh, flying elephants with Laurel and Hardy and a couple of Keystone films that were again cut down just uh, three minute films but uh, the museum actually discovered 
some of these these lost SNA films in truncated formats that were part of what Screen Souvenirs, which was a 1930s kind of riff on silent film and yeah they um they were produced by paramount uh from 1931 to 1935 they would uh show sequences from silent films uh also uh some footage from typically from the 1890s and then some short clips uh with various silent film personalities uh inviting the audience to identify them and then they would end up with a cut down version of usually a one reel film that uh, uh, maintained the storyline but in the uh, audio track they would essentially make fun of all of the silent films throughout the the reel so 42 of these were produced and uh, our museum collection has got 16 of them and I just by accident, uh, I was trying to uh, catalog our collection, put it into a Word document that could be searched, and I noticed in the uh, description for one of the films, uh, uh, an SNA film that I thought had been lost and uh, I'd never seen before, even though I tried to look at every single SNA film that seems to survive in archives around the world. And uh, this one, particular one, uh, The Soul Kiss from 1908, uh, was in one of these compilations. And uh, I looked at it and recognized Ben Turpin in it. And so I started looking through the other screen souvenirs uh, films to see what else there might be. And I found uh, lots of short clips and uh, and also some some of these condensed versions, uh, about nine of those. So essentially, I mean, some of those films only exist in that in that shortened format, and the only reason why they survive is because they were used in these screen souvenir comedies, essentially making fun of them, but... Right, they, yeah, they were copied in the early film, in the early 30s when when uh, more of these films were around. Uh, the uh, SNA Chicago studio that had all of these negatives originally um, essentially got sold in the in around 1933 1934 and all the contents of the uh, studio building were either destroyed or given away or sold or taken by various people and companies and including all the equipment and so um, this happened right before this screen souvenir series started, so they were probably working with camera negative material. Wow. And uh, so most of the films in these uh, excerpts look extremely good uh, because they're, you know, early generation material. So let's, uh, let's get into a little bit of 1914, 1915. So the SNA Studios has been making films, uh, the Snakeville comedies, the Bronco Billy westerns, and in Chicago they had another studio, which was the original SNA studio, that was making uh, like dramas and things. Right. Yeah. And Bronco Billy came out here to make westerns because obviously this area is perfect for for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the studio was doing pretty well. Yes, yeah, very well. They were the studio here in Niles was the most successful silent era movie studio in the Bay Area. Wow. So uh, they were, you know, making a profit off off of every single film that they were producing. In fact, they were so popular that in 1918, after SNA started or stopped making original productions, they were actually releasing these Snakeville comedies and Bronco Belly films, 10 films at a time to to theaters to show them again. So they were very popular, and a lot of the Chicago studio films weren't weren't as popular. The, the uh, they were making a marginal profit off of of uh, their short films, and I think maybe a little better off of some of their features. But uh, you know, they were producing two or three times as many as the Nile Studio mm -hmm. every week. 
1914, the end of 1914 rolls around, and um, Charlie Chaplin's looking for a way to get out of the Keystone Studios. Mm -hmm. Max Sennett's not going to give him any more money. He's Mm -hmm. becoming super popular. Who was it, in fact, that reached out to Charlie? It was Bronco Billy? Uh, First, Jess Robbins reached out to him, and then Anderson, Bronco Billy Anderson, went down to Los Angeles with a contract. He didn't inform his partner, George Spohr, (laughs) and uh, knew that it might be a problem, but he did it anyway because he felt like Chaplin was an important up-and-coming comedian and uh, and it would be a a shot in the arm for the company. So so Anderson signed Charlie to a contract and uh, when Spohr found out, he was furious, but couldn't really do anything about it because his partner had made the made decision these, already. Made the contract and made the agreement, and so they had to abide by it. Essentially, they hire Charlie, and he comes out here to Niles, and he took one look at it and said, "This is." He wasn't interested in working here, so they sent him to Chicago. Is that That's correct? Right. Yeah, the Niles Studio was a small place in a small town. You know, San Francisco was nearby, but. Uh, Uh, It wasn't like it was in the heart of a big city like Los Angeles. Um, Which is what he was used to by then. Yeah, so um, uh, the alternative was to go to Chicago, which was a bigger studio in a bigger city. So uh, Chaplin agreed to that, and Anderson took him by train to Chicago. They went there together, uh, along with Jess Robbins, who was going to be Chaplin's essentially... Uh, production manager for the films and uh, so all three of them went to Chicago George Spohr eventually got over his anger at uh, Anderson signing Chaplin when uh, orders started coming in <laughs> <laughs> for the Chaplin films yeah uh, was he not aware of, of the popularity of Charlie or no he... Spohr didn't know anything about Charlie Chaplin and, wow and uh, so uh, it, it took the the call of money and uh, other people telling him that this was a good idea for Spohr to come around and and uh, embrace the idea. And years later, when, uh, you know, in the late twenties and early thirties, Spohr downplayed all that and you know almost made it sound like he was responsible, <laughs> which is kind of, of a thing that Spohr did. At any rate, uh, Chaplin went there. Uh, didn't really like the working conditions in Chicago. It was, it was quite regimented there. And he made uh, one film, his new job. Yes. There, his first SNA, which is essentially a, a, a parody of the Keystone Studios. Yeah, uh, Charlie kind of remade the uh, film that he had made there before, and is but that, uh, you know that that's okay. It, uh, well, essentially, I mean, he's taking a jab at his his old, his old boss because the the director and his new job looks a lot like Senate. He does, yeah, yeah. I so, think they call it what Lockstone yes, Studios. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there were some uh, definite parallels there, and uh, Charlie picked out Ben Turpin and Leo White, who were working at the Chicago studio, as people that he wanted to work with. So that film was done, and by that time, Charlie was thinking that Niles was looking pretty good, and so decided uh, (laughs) by this time, uh, Anderson, who had gone to New York for a little while to do whatever he was going to do there, came back to Chicago, and Charlie was ready to go back to California, and so they actually came back with several of the other people from the Chicago studio with them, including Ben Turpin and Leo White and uh, Charlotte Minow, who was also at the Chicago studio, Jess Robbins. uh, So they all came back by train and uh, arrived in Niles and started working on A Night Out. And A Night Out is a very interesting film, uh, just because of the fact that it's the first film with Edna Purviance in it. That's right, yeah. uh, Which he discovered, uh, she was a secretary yeah, she ac- actually answered an advertisement that SNA put in the newspapers uh, in San Francisco looking for a beautiful woman to work in movies, and uh, she applied with a couple of other people, who'd uh, one who'd had some stage experience. 
Sadie Carr and another woman, Margie Rieger, who I don't think had any film experience at all. So the three of them came to Niles and they're all signed in together at the Belvoir Hotel guest register. Edna won out, Sadie Carr went back to San Francisco and Margie worked in some of the SNA comedies that weren't directed by Chaplin here in Niles and then later on went to uh, Los Angeles with the comedy company that uh, Chaplin was a part of that uh, they established uh, a rental studio down in Los Angeles for Chaplin to work there. Now there's a, a couple films. The films that were made in Niles, uh, the Chaplin films, were A Night Out, In the Park, The Champion. Jitney Elopement. Jitney Elopement. And The Tramp. And The Tramp, yeah. Sorry, I had a brain freeze there. The most famous shot, one of the most famous early shots of, of Chaplin was taken in the Niles Canyon where he's walking off into the... You know, Distance. Iris out, That's which right. he would use up until modern times. He'd use that famous shot in the circus and mm -hmm. and a few other films. Yep. Um, that area is now a highway that you really can't recreate that shot on for any vacation goers yeah. that want to take a picture there. You can't stop there. It's a two lane highway, paved instead of dirt road. But otherwise, it it looks pretty much like it did a hundred years ago. The hills are still the same as in that film. You know, you can recognize the location because of the hillside in the background. We know here exactly where it was shot. It's just that it's difficult to stop there and oh, take of course. photographs or anything. And some Although, other spots. I mean, there's Niles is essentially a, a town that hasn't changed in a hundred years. Uh, ben Turpin's house is still here. Raleigh Tothro's house is still here. Yeah, the tin houses that SNA built, or I should say Anderson built for cast and crew people, all ten of them still survive. Unfortunately, the studio was torn down in 1933, but um, the rest of the town still has that look of a hundred years ago, for the most part, and uh, many things survived that SNA used when they were shooting films here in town and in the canyon. Um, so uh, it's still got that atmosphere and a small town feel to it as well. And Charlie is definitely represented in this town. I mean, you go into every store and there's Charlie knickknacks and T-shirts and statues. And everybody knows the history of, of, there's even a pizza place named after Bronco Billy. So this town definitely lives on its history. It's not like Los Angeles that can't wait to tear everything down and rebuild a mega mall over it. Yeah, there's still, you know, buildings in town. Unfortunately, the studio isn't one of them, but that's because it was so close to the railroad tracks that when talkies came in, uh, it was going to be impossible to shoot talking pictures in town. Near the railroad with tracks. The railroad tracks 50 feet from, <laughs> from the uh, studio building, so uh, the owner of the building decided to tear it down during the depression to salvage its lumber and steel so uh, it's gone but the houses had a new life because they could become private residences yeah so uh, uh, you know things have been recycled over the years in that respect that's one of the reasons why Niles survives as it is because it's it's out of the way from the rest of so-called modern civilization in a way yeah uh, if the studio had been in San Francisco, then everything would be gone, mm -hmm. and and you wouldn't be able to have as many identification points here in Niles as if if it were in San Francisco. We know where Raleigh lived. We know where Ben Turpin lived. Mm -hmm. We know where a lot of the SNA cast and crew. We know where Bronco Billy lived. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, there's a famous story you actually told me. Charlie describes in his autobiography about. Uh, being invited to Anderson's house to stay there while he was in Niles and uh, being shocked by this millionaire cowboy who was living in squalor. <laughs> he didn't uh, live, he only lived there when he was making films, right? That's right, yeah. He had a suite at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco that he would stay at uh, and have fun when he wasn't here in Niles uh, making films. And, and the whole point of being in Niles was to produce those films. It wasn't to 
uh, live the, the rich life. And he would do a, uh, a week where he'd make a bunch of films just to get them all out of the way so he could get back to San Francisco, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> he he prided himself in turning out films as, at, a, at a fantastic pace. Uh, the snakeville comedies that were being produced at the same time and released every week were you know, more leisurely schedule, you know, it would take two or three days to make a, a Snakeville comedy and uh, and they would be uh, working on those continuously in other dramatic films, mostly westerns here in Niles. But Anderson uh, was a restless kind of character and, uh, and uh, liked to keep on moving with things. And so he had his own way of working. Uh, he would come up with a story or get one from his uh, scenario department head, Josephine Rector, work it all out in his mind, uh, maybe write something on paper, but he wouldn't show it to anybody else. He would just direct the actors for each shot and each scene, telling them what to do, and uh, without them knowing the outcome of the story or it, or the progress of it at all. And uh, he would just uh, barrel through these things, shot after shot, and uh, finish it that way. And uh, Tom Kreiser, one of the SNA Cowboys, how to edit film. And uh, so he would turn it all over to Tom Kreiser to do the editing. Later on, Tom worked for Harold Lloyd and Hal Roach hmm. in their movies down south. Now, a film The Champion that Charlie made, um, that's one of the most, outside of The Tramp, that's probably the one you show at the museum the most, yeah. especially to, to children's groups that come through because they like the, the dog and they like, you know, the, 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 boxing, the match. boxing match. Um, you show, the, when the children come in and you, you do tours, you usually show them um, the, the champion. And when older tour groups come through, you usually show them the tramp because they can appreciate that a little more than, That's than the other film. Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll mention too, I mean, the museum is connected to. Uh, Nickelodeon that was built in 1913 and it's been various things over the years uh, but, uh, but yeah. David mm -hmm. has restored it and his crew and uh, with the help of a lot of volunteers over the years they've done their best to restore it back to its original luster it's still a work in progress uh, yeah yeah it's getting there uh, it, uh, the, the theater building was built in 1913 as a movie theater and it operated that way for 10 years. It was one of the licensed theaters with the Motion Picture Patents Company, of which SNA was a member. So it showed films from Vitagraph and Sea League and Edison and uh, Calum and SNA and other Patents Company members. And so it was a block down from the SNA studios, pretty much, right? Yes. Right but, next door, uh, almost. Yeah. So all of the SNA people, including Charlie Chaplin, came here to watch their own films and their competitors' films. Mm -hmm. Getting back to The Champion, uh, The Champion and his regeneration have a, a, an odd but a, an inter interesting connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mutual association. Ch Charlie uh, has uh, Anderson do a little cameo scene in The Champion and, and Bronco Billy returned the favor in his regeneration with Charlie doing a little bit at the beginning of that film. so uh, And Charlie co-directed the film with, or special assistance, or whatever they what they call it on the main titles of the yeah, film? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what kind of... I think maybe Charlie did his own thing while he was in the film, and, and Anderson, who had an idea of what the rest of the film was going to be, just did that after Charlie's guest appearance. And... Uh, so uh, was Charlie mentioned in the in the advertisement for his regeneration, or was it just kind of a special? I don't when recall. the film started. It was just like, oh, here, okay. I I don't recall them in the advertisements mentioning Charlie, but uh, it would probably have been a special treat for people who had seen Anderson's film on the screen, you know. He, and he was popular at that time, so a lot of people would have seen it and uh, and I'm sure word of mouth would have uh, yeah. uh, given it some extra mileage which is one of the reasons why that film survives when other Anderson films don't. Yeah, I can see a time where they would have built that as a Chaplin film, mm -hmm. kind of like The Knockout or 
That's right. Or uh, Thief Catcher, mm -hmm. you know, where he's in about six seconds of it, but because mm -hmm. he's in it, they can call it a Chaplin film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think that Bronco Billy was recognized in the the champion, even though he's just in a big crowd scene, essentially? Yeah, he was recognized around the world, and I'm sure that uh, fans of his uh, picked him out of the crowd. Because he's right up front there. He is, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, he's making a... Uh, himself known too he's not shrinking away <laughs> so um let's see so charlie is making films out here with edna nobody specifically knows where charlie was staying at this time when he was out in niles or where edna was staying right. we have ideas but we're not 100 percent sure well of course from chaplin's autobiography it implies that he stayed at anderson's bungalow when he was in niles um but also, you know, there's rumors from families uh, who lived in the, in this area for a hundred years, claiming that Charlie stayed at their place. It's kind of like <laughs> George what Washington says. slept here. Uh, Char, you know, in that case, you know, Charlie stayed at about ten different places in Niles while he was here, which seems very unlikely. The newspapers of the day don't mention anything specific uh, and there's one mention in the 1960s of a guy who had been living here for uh, 50 years when the old theater the second theater burnt down uh, mentioning that he thought Charlie stayed at the Niles Hotel uh, other people mentioned that or have uh, supplied a rumor that Charlie stayed at the Wesley Hotel, and uh, I've I've heard uh, a taped conversation with the daughter of the owner of the Belvoir Hotel, who said that Charlie didn't stay at the Belvoir. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, she didn't say where she thought he did stay. Say which would have been you know a little more collaborative effort. Uh, and some Evidence. Were, some people say that Edna stayed in the house right next to the Nickelodeon here. That's still here. I mean, it's not yeah. confirmed, but it's... That's because of a photograph that we've got that uh, was sold on eBay some years ago showing Charlie and Edna standing inside a fence of the house next door for a photograph. There's no mention on, in the photograph about Charlie or Edna or both of them staying there, but because they're inside the fence, is uh, somebody had people to be, speculated yeah. that uh, somebody, one of those two people, was staying there. I don't know. And it's safe to say that wherever Edna was staying, Charlie was probably there a lot. <laughs> although, yes, there, although apparently he wasn't allowed to spend the night. <laughs> yeah, there were there were uh, uh, local references uh, in later years that. Uh, their relationship was somewhat scandalous in town. <laughs> everybody knew everybody's business. But again, there was no mention in any of the two local papers of that era that uh, of anything in particular that was going on. Um, there's some shots in The Champion that uh, were filmed outside the studio and inside the studio where Charlie hits the cop over the head, and there's some shots where you can see the back of the studio, mm -hmm. uh, as there are in a lot of the SNA and the Snakeville comedies, mm -hmm. that unfortunately they're not, a lot of them aren't available. Um, they show prints of them here at the museum, but w if you visit here, you can really get a sense of where these spots were, and you can hold photos up, or screen grabs, and you can stand in the same spots where Charlie bopped the cop. Isn't the uh, beginning of the champion, where he's feeding the, the dog, isn't that a... Uh, I don't know where that location is. It just shows a doorway, and, and that could have been anywhere. Gotcha. Um, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a jitney elopement. Uh, you can see the windmills in the background and the mountains and everything. Those are Yeah, that's true. So yeah. it gives a, it really gives you a sense of, of the area, and uh, a lot of the stuff is still here, the, the houses and, and all that. Unfortunately, the studio uh, was torn down in 1933. Right. So... Charlie makes his films here in Niles. Was there a point where he started to get frustrated with SNA as far as, was there a specific time where they started telling him to hurry up? I think they always told him to hurry up <laughs> uh, because the uh, 
popularity was growing so greatly, uh, and he was costing them, you know, twelve hundred and fifty dollars a week, uh, more than anybody except for Spore and Anderson were making that amount, more than that, that amount of money. They wanted to turn them out as quickly as possible, and it shows from, you know, the release dates. Normally, an SNA film it would take after they'd actually finished shooting the film, it would take them about two months to get the film release printed, all the publicity materials done, and uh, the films into the exchanges in, in theaters. With Chaplin's films, uh, they were cutting down the, the lag time to about two weeks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Charlie was always under pressure to turn out more. I think he had a contract to, to produce 16 films in a year. And uh, and he just got slower and slower. I th the first one took about two weeks in Chicago. I think he made In the Park, which is a one-reeler, in just a couple of days because... They he had were, to. He had to get it yeah. out as quickly as possible. But, uh, I, you know, he, he finished the tramp on like April 3rd and it was scheduled for le release on April 12th. Wow. And no theater got it on April 12th because they simply could not get it out to the theaters fast enough. It took another week for the films to actually appear on the screen, but that's how much pressure Chaplin was under because most SMA films, if they made 40 prints for a single release that were distributed around the country. That was the average. Uh, the Bronco Billy films, they made a bit more. Chaplin's films, when they really got underway, were making 250 prints. Wow. I mean, 1915 was the Chaplin boom. I yes, mean, it was. He was popular at Keystone, but I don't think it really hit until the SNA film. I would say maybe it's because of the Keystone films, the popularity of those. And so once he got yeah. here, it was just like Beatlemania, yeah. essentially. That's when you started seeing the uh, uh, Chaplin lookalike contests. Which the, they still do here in Niles every year, by the way. Chaplin days. And the uh, Keystone films being pirated and recut and retitled uh, so that people would think that they were new releases. And that's when, uh, you know, SNA Chaplin films were being stolen. And, and people were peddling the prints to, for more money. At that time, you could put just a figure of Charlie Chaplin in front of a theater and people would walk in because they wanted to see him. They, people were having being more interested in the two real Chaplin comedies than the feature films that were being shown yeah. with Chaplin. Wow, that's like in more recent days when a popular movie trailer would be released, and people would go to see the movie trailer, pay for the film, and then leave. Yes. <laughs> you know, they did that for Batman in 1989 mm -hmm. and, and the Star Wars films. Um, now with the internet, you know, you can just watch them online, but back then I just can't imagine paying for a film to see a trailer and then leaving. The film people must have loved it, though, because these films got great, mm -hmm. <laughs> great box office yeah. coming in. And there were also all these, uh, you know, Chaplin figurines and all this Chaplin merchandising as well. It's one of the earliest... Can you think of an earlier uh, film character? I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of Bronco Billy uh, merchandise, was there? In 1914-15? There, there was Bronco Billy sheet music, which was popular for a lot of silent stars. There was an Alkali Ike doll in 1913 for Augustus Carney. Really? Who played that character in the Snakeville comedies. How many of those still exist? I've never seen one. Oh, wow. And there were other things like that, but nothing on the scale of Chaplin. Mm -hmm. So he wraps up his films here in Niles uh, with The Tramp, and mm -hmm. that was the last film he made here, and uh, it's right. kind of symbolic. The last shot of him walking into the canyon is him kind of walking, walking out away. of Niles. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened? What, what caused him? So he went to Chicago. He made the one film there. He made five films here in Niles. Mm -hmm. This is amazing when you think this about is like it. How, four months. How, how much he jumped around. Mm-hmm. And he decided that uh, Niles wasn't for him anymore. 
So he made SNA rent studio space out in Los Angeles so That's he could right. go back home, essentially, yeah. where he, he was comfortable. He wanted to go back to Los Angeles, and, and there was vacant studios available for SNA to rent for him. And uh, they chose the Bradbury Building in Los Angeles, where just before that, Hal Roach had been trying to, to make start his directing career and uh, temporarily failed, and uh, SNA actually hired Hal Roach to direct SNA actors who weren't appearing in Chaplin's comedies down in, at that studio. So Harold Lo uh, Hal Roach directed about five SNA comedies uh, while Chaplin was there in town uh, working on his SNA films, and Chaplin finished out the rest of his contract with SNA in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, he made uh, Burlesque on Carmen. What are some of the last ones? A Woman. Police. Police. Uh, Shanghai. The Bank. By the Sea, which was a run-reeler. That was the first one that he made in, in Los Angeles. And again, it was a one-reeler so that they could produce it as quickly as possible to get it released so while they were kind of getting settled in, yeah. in Los Angeles. Now, was it around this time he started negotiations with Mutual? Uh, Early 1916, right? I don't think he did that until, yeah, 1916. Uh, after things kind of fell apart with negotiating with George Spohr, Anderson and Chaplin actually went together to Chicago to talk about a new contract with Spohr. And Anderson really wanted to keep Charlie. I mean, he you, you got to hand it to him. He had the... I, I can't imagine any studio wanting to lose Charlie in 1916. Yeah, Charlie was as much money as they were costing SNA. Charlie was making money for them. Yeah, and even even when Charlie was asking for ten thousand dollars a week, SNA still could have made money with them. Spore, who was used to paying twenty five dollars a week yeah, to his yeah. actors, just could not fathom that kind of amount of money. I mean, so. <laughs> the SNA uh, year, years, I'll say, kind of bled over into 1916, is amazing because so many people f that would carry on with him for the rest of his career, he met while he was making films here. I mean, there's mm -hmm. Edna, obviously, which is a whole story on her own, mm -hmm. um, Leo White, mm -hmm. uh, and Raleigh, mm -hmm. his cameraman, who would stay with him until The Great Dictator. But ironically enough... Uh, Raleigh didn't actually shoot any of the SNA Chaplin films. Right. And Raleigh was shooting the Snakefield comedies here in Niles at that time. And Harry Ensign, who was, had been working on the Bronco Billy films, uh, actually, Harry Ensign had been working on the Snakefield comedies with, directed by Roy Clements. And uh, so I guess figuring that Harry was used to the uh, the comedy films, that's why... They, they connected him up with Chaplin. Um, they must have developed a, f a friendship of sorts. I mean, if if yeah. the fact they didn't actually work on any films together, but somehow Charlie recruited him when he moved to Mutual, that says a lot. I mean, there mm -hmm. has to be some sort of friendship going on I, there. I think there was, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Chaplin was, I'm sure, familiar with Raleigh's work, and uh, so... Uh, wasn't a stretch to hire him after the studio closed down here and Raleigh went down to Los Angeles looking for work. What was Charlie and Ben Turpin's relationship like? I mean, they're obviously really good in, in uh, A Night Out, but they really didn't remain... F they were more work associates. They didn't necessarily spend a lot of time together like... Right. They, they had different personalities for sure. And uh, Ben always credited Charlie with being the person that uh, put him in the big leagues. Mm. Before that, Ben had been a lowly $20 a week actor for SNA. And uh, Spore would never give him a raise. Ben was SNA's first actor in 1907. And, uh, the soul kiss, right? <laughs> No, it was oh. uh, an awful skate. Oh, that's right. Or a hobo right. on okay. rollers. And uh, it shows Ben Turpin as a hobo on roller skates, uh, 
going down the streets of Chicago, bumping into people. And uh, that's essentially the whole film. <laughs> wow. And what year was that? 1907. Well, which year was A Soul Kiss? That mm -hmm. was 1908, the next oh, year. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and, uh, ben they, they screened that one a couple of days ago. Yes. Yeah, I got to see that. Ben lasted in, at SNA until 1909 when he was getting so much abuse from these slapstick comedies that he he quit and went back to vaudeville for a while and and worked for actually a couple of different movie companies but ended up coming back to the chicago sna studio in 1913 working with wallace berry and some of berry's sweetie comedies and, and the other comedies that uh Barry was acting in. But yeah, Wallace, still not getting anywhere, you know, ahead. Yeah, and it wasn't until Chaplin came to Chicago, and liked Ben, thought he was a really funny-looking character, that he put him in that film, and uh, and then brought him to Niles. The problem uh, was that after a night out, people were looking at Chaplin and Turpin as a comedy team oh. because they were drunks together throughout the film. It's kind of a remake of uh, The Rounders with a, Charlie and uh, yeah. Fatty Arbuckle. In a, in a, in a way it and is. And a little Mabel Strange Predicament. Yeah. yeah. A combination of the two films. But Charlie didn't like the idea of being a team with anybody and so he he cut back severely on on Ben's footage in The Champion which is just essentially just one short shot of him hawking food it, it, during the, the fight. After Charlie kind of pushes Ben out of the spotlight as a comedy duo, uh, Ben starts working on the Snakeville comedies, and right. he stays in Niles, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. Charlie leaves uh, Niles in April of 1915, and Ben stays here to work in the Snakeville comedies. Ben remained friends with a lot of people. Uh, that's what uh, I was told. Ben came back after he was done filming movies here he came back because he had a lot of friends yeah ben was kind of considered the unofficial mayor of of niles there was no official mayor of any sort uh, it was an unincorporated town little town of 1400 people ben was a beloved character in niles yeah and uh, uh and he really was the only one who would come back in later years after he was more famous and uh, visit people who were friends that he'd made while he was here at SNA. Yeah, it's somebody that doesn't really get the the mentions that uh, you'd think that they would. I mean, Ben started off at SNA as a janitor, right? He was a janitor, and then he worked his way into the films. Uh, he actually had that dual job of when he wasn't working as an actor, he was a janitor hmm. at the Chicago's first studio on. Clark Street, uh, and then later they had a, a small studio on Wells Street, and then in 1909 they started up the, the studio on Argyle Street that's still there today. The film Burlesque on Carmen, I've always been interested in kind of the background of that film because, we, I mean, we did a commentary track for it, and I really wanted to dive into whose idea that was. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about, about this, and you seem to think it was Charlie's idea and not SNA. And that interested me because Charlie Chaplin never seemed like the kind of person who would do a parody film on someone else's work. Well, I think it was brought to his attention because Cecil B. DeMille was doing a Carmen and so was uh, Theda Berra doing a Carmen. Charlie picked up on things that were around him. He named a jitney elopement uh, that name because... In San Francisco in 1915, uh, Jitney automobiles became a craze. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were kind of like the Uber of their day. And uh, There's a sheet music, like the Jitney bus yeah. that I've seen that came out around that time with Charlie on so, the cover. So the film has nothing to do with the Jitney automobiles, but he just called it that because it was the rage of the day and it was something that he just picked up on. Interesting. So uh, that's what he did with Carmen and uh, you know it was a film that 
was ripe for parody, so yeah. uh, why not do it? Exactly. He'd I mean, been familiar with doing parodies of things before and on they, the stage. And they put so much money into that film, uh, the costumes and the sets. I mean, you look at a film like In the Park, some of the Charlie S and A's, and it, you know, there's not a whole lot there that they really had to build. No. But that film, they, and if you watch the uh, Geraldine Farrar version, right? Mm-hmm. It looks almost identical. The camera angles, the shots, mm-hmm. the backgrounds. I was even wondering if they used the same sets. I mean, I know that wasn't the case, but mm-hmm. they a lot of money was pumped into that film, so mm-hmm. it tells me that they expected big returns on this. Yeah, well, they and they expected even bigger returns uh, when uh, SNA decided to add two more reels to it and With turn ba- it into a short feature film. Yeah, that you know Charlie had previously been talking about making a feature film while he was continuing to make these two reelers uh, a film called Life and uh, uh, he just couldn't pull it off uh, under uh, the time constraints um, that's right under the time constraints that he was under so uh, I think that was probably a fixation of George Spores having a feature Chaplin film would bring in even more money and so was a little doctoring, they could uh, turn it into something like that. And so that's what they did. Charlie was concerned that Carmen wasn't being released after he finished it, and with good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the two-reel version was never released that Charlie made. It was, it was yeah. pumped into a four-reel version with Ben Turpin and a bunch of scenes that had nothing to do with anything Charlie uh, had directed. Right. But uh, since then, was it David Shepard went back in and, and cut the four-reel version of Carmen down to what he thinks was the Charlie-approved directed version. We don't know 100% uh, what it was, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, that's the version that Charlie put together. And I, I think it is a much better film, because uh, stretching it into four reels doesn't sound like uh, a great a idea. Much. Yeah, a little, <laughs> little much. Kind of like triple trouble <laughs> yeah and uh so that's that's the next thing i want to talk a little bit about so charlie leaves sna goes to mutual for a whole lot more money sna folds in 1918 it, well you might say that they it's it's not like they went bankrupt they just closed the doors by that time george Spohr was a millionaire uh and uh he could afford just to shut the doors he didn't need the aggravation of trying to continue to run the studio when uh, it was didn't need becoming, the money. He didn't need the money and it was get, becoming more and more difficult with rising star salaries and uh, scenario prices rising as well. So he just had enough of it by that time and by and falling profits too. The the profit margin from the early days when they started was tremendous. You know, they could make a film for a couple of hundred dollars and realize five to ten thousand dollars out of a single one real film. Mm-hmm. That profit margin was no longer there in 1918. So, uh, what was Bronco Billy doing? And was he still making cowboy films in 1918? Uh, he'd actually been away from films for two years and he'd started again to make films, feature films in 1918, which unfortunately were not so successful. He didn't find a proper releasing relationship, and maybe also people just uh, were looking to other stars like Tom Mix and William S. Hart for the kind of Western films that uh, were being made by that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, So only one of the two features that he made survives the son of a gun it's an okay film but if anderson had been making feature films starting in 1914 when he wanted to then chances are he would have been much farther along than he would have been in 1918 when he was trying to do it for the first time Although he did receive, in 1958, an Academy Award. What was that, uh, just cel- a celebration of his pioneering? It says on the award for his contributions to motion pictures as entertainment. Mm-hmm. And it 
refers to his days as Bronco Billy at SNA. Uh, I know there's a Clint Eastwood film called Bronco Billy. I don't think it has anything to do with with nothing at all with GM Anderson, but uh, at least the name is there, so it's a name that people have heard before. Yes, but you know he Anderson made a couple of tr- attempts at a comeback. Uh, in 1918 and then again in 1922 with no good results and he retired in 1923 so retiring that early uh, he was pretty much forgotten by the time talkies came in except in the memories of little kids who'd grown up yeah what are some of your favorite uh, Bronco Billy films I know um, most of them are unfortunately not available Mm mm-hmm um, maybe someday they they will be. We we'll get some digital transfers. Some of them are coming up online uh, through thanks to the I Institute in Amsterdam that's making a conscientious effort of putting films in their collection online. One of them is Bronco Billy's Christmas Dinner. Which that's is, a great film. Yeah, you ran that for me. That's my favorite one. I have yeah, to say that's from 1911 that he made in San Rafael, just when. The Bronco Billy series was really starting to take off. There's others as well that, um, there's a couple of others that are online that are pretty interesting. And uh, we showed a couple of interesting ones this last weekend for our Bronco Billy Silent Film Festival. Yeah, every year at the Niles Museum they do Charlie Chaplin Days and they do a Bronco Billy Film Festival um, where they show a lot of SNA films that you really can't see anywhere else uh, that have been restored and uh, saved by David and other people, but, I mean, David's been the champion of these SNA films. Mm-hmm. There's uh, one called Bronco Billy's Heart that's I, very interesting, and uh, Bronco Billy and the Sheriff's Kid, that's I really like a lot. Bronco Billy and the Rustler's Child, which is also a very interesting film, and others as well. Unfortunately, they're in archives that uh, don't show them often, so... Uh, about the only chance you get is when we show them at our festival here. We hope to change that someday, mm-hmm. uh, getting copies in our collection so that we can do something with them. Yeah. So in 1916, Charlie leaves SNA for Mutual. Uh, two years go by. By this time, Charlie's working at First National, and but suddenly SNA releases a new Chaplin film two years after he leaves the studio, mm-hmm. Triple Trouble. Now uh, we've gone over this film a little bit in the past, but. Basically what it is, uh, they took a bunch of unused Chaplin footage that he was working on for a film called Life that was going to be a feature film, and they decided to take those little bits and pieces and make a new film around the surviving Chaplin outtake footage that he had. So when a lot of Chaplin fans think about SNA, they seem to think of it in a negative light because of the uh, re-edit of Carmen and the Triple Trouble film. But in a way, you kind of have to give it to SNA because in retrospect, without them doing what they did with a film like Triple Trouble, you wouldn't have that footage of Charlie. That wouldn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I always found those films kind of interesting because the SNA footage ended up getting bought and sold by different companies and they reissued them as part of the the screen souvenirs. And then the Charlie Chaplin, what was it, the Art of Comedy, which was like a documentary, kind of a feature, mm-hmm. that they kind of strung, took all the SNA footage, the best shots, and kind of strung them together into a feature. So the SNA films live on in, in one way or another. Yeah, there's 100% of Charlie's work <laughs> for SNA surviving compared to, you know, 10 or 12% for the rest of the company's work. So Yeah, the snake that film comedies and... <laughs> Bronco Billy's definitely somebody that uh, deserves more recognition because he was the first Clint Eastwood and John Wayne and all these people. Yeah. Uh, he was the archetype for, for that Hollywood cowboy, yeah. the anti-hero. Yeah. Uh, you know, even William S. Hart even remade stories that Bronco Billy pioneered before that. So you had to start somewhere, and, and Bronco Billy was the beginning of it all. Yeah. When people think of you know, cowboy movies. Bronco Billy kind of started that whole that whole trend. Recently, the museum was featured on, this is probably a couple of years ago now, but uh, was featured on 60 Minutes. You had a remarkable uh, discovery, a film called A Trip Down Market Street mm-hmm. that you discovered uh, was actually dated wrong. Mm-hmm. It was the wrong date, and you were able to identify the the time period in which it was made was the actual day, right? 
right. a couple of days be- before the San Francisco earthquake. Four days before the earthquake, yeah. And that got the museum featured on 60 Minutes and and a lot of a, a press, yes. positive press for the museum. Mm-hmm. Of course, your book, Bronco Billy and the SNA Film Company. Mm-hmm. What was that like? What was that like getting that mass media exposure? And by the way, it is on YouTube, um, and I'll, I'll post a link so people can check that out too. What was that like to all of a sudden get all that mass exposure from Morley Safer, who actually visited here in 60 Minutes? Yeah, it was great and surprising. and uh, It's the kind of publicity you can't pay for. So, uh, you know, we were getting phone calls and emails all the time because of that, and uh, and attendance rose at the theater, and uh, all the positive things that you can think of from uh, attention like that. Mm-hmm. A museum like this lives on the publicity that it can generate uh, because people are discovering the place all the time, and it's difficult to, uh, to get the word out in the usual ways for people to find out what we're about. Mm-hmm. So I won't make you repeat the whole the whole 60 Minutes interview. I mean, we, I can post a link and, and they can read that for themselves, but mm-hmm. it's just a real interesting uh, situation. I mean, you, you took had this footage of a cable car going down Market Street mm-hmm. in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. How did you discover it was the wrong date? Um, well, I, at first I actually assumed that it was the right date, but what interested me was that um, 2005, the Exploratorium was going to put on a 100th anniversary celebration of the film. And uh, so they were generating all this publicity and interest in the film. It struck me that uh, with all the publicity, they really couldn't tell anybody about how the film originated, who made the film, why it was made, and uh, details about it's filming. It struck me as strange that a film that was made in the middle of San Francisco in 1905 when filmmaking was so new that nobody had written about what happened at that time. And mm-hmm. so I, based upon the information supplied by the Library of Congress that dated it from 1905, September, from the time on the ferry building clock, which you can see in the film, and the angle of the shadows of, on the street and the state of the building construction and at that time. I looked in the five San Francisco newspapers on microfilm day by day from August 1905 to October 1905 to see if anything had been written about how or who made it. Mm-hmm. And I was able to find out nothing. By looking at the film closely, I could see that there were water puddles on the street indicating that there was a recent rain. And looking at the weather reports from that time period, I found that there was no rainfall at all during that time period. And so that further piqued my interest in what was really going on with that film. Yeah. By further research, I was able to find out that it was shot at a wholly different time of year in uh, what appeared to be March or April and in 1906 rather than 1905 because of the building construction on the Market Street and not 1907 because there are clearly cable cars on Market Street and after the earthquake of 1906 that line was electrified and there oh, were no yeah. more cable cars on San, on the street Market Street so it had to be March or April of 1906, and by, f- by finding license plate records and theatrical trade magazine advertisements... Reading I'm, them off the buildings and the cars, right? Yeah. 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 Well, there were actually advertisements by the Miles Brothers who had actually ended up being the first bi-coastal movie company. They had an office in San Francisco and one in New York, and they advertised in April of 1906, a trip down Market Street as a new release. Mm. And nobody had ever ever bothered to look that up before. So uh, that and the, and the uh, license plate records, which confirmed that one of the cars was registered in January of 1906, another one in February of 1906. 
That's true detective work yeah. there. I mean, that's how, how, how long did it take you to, to really discover all it this? It took a couple of months gotcha. going back and forth. All microfilm work and a few emails to people. Uh, there was a guy who was a licensed plate collector who had monthly bulletins. Wow. I was able to find out information that way. And eventually I did find a San Francisco Chronic call newspaper article that gave a two-paragraph article about the Miles Brothers making a movie on Market Street so that the world could see yeah. this famous street. Speaking of dedication to this craft, um, there's the trip down Market Street discovery, which you, which you uh, spearheaded, and then a film called Bronco Billy and the Bandit's Secret, which was filmed a couple of years ago and is a new Bronco Billy film filmed with all original silent film cameras, filmed right here in Niles, uh, and it's sort of a tribute to Bronco Billy, it's a tribute to Niles, it's a great little film, we screened it here at the museum, along with a little documentary about the making of the film, um, just briefly, we don't have to get into it too deeply, but uh, mm. explain what that's all about. Well, I, it seemed like a good idea to, to make a, a film celebrating the 100th anniversary of SNA and Niles, what better way to do it than make a, an SNA type film with a hand cranked movie camera? We had all this equipment in our collection that works, and uh, it just seemed like a great idea when we've got the Niles Canyon Railroad here, we've got gunfighter reenactors in the area, we've got a stagecoach in the area, and horses, and Niles Canyon, and so many locations in Niles that were used originally that are still here. Why not use all of that and make a film? And, and so, baby Peggy. And baby Peggy, who was a, <laughs> whose father worked in SNA films here in wow. Niles. And that's how she got her film career, because her father got a, a taste of filmmaking here in Niles. So, And this film uh, it had its premiere at the Egyptian? Uh, it was shown at the Egyptian Theater, a, a couple of years ago. Actually, the work print was shown. We showed the, the final release version here in, in our theater. And, uh, Which actually, the, the theater itself is in the movie. Yes. And uh, the outside of the theater, they built reproduction sets of the kind of sets they were building in, in the SNA days right outside the theater, which is still here. So if you come to the, the theater and the museum and visit it, you, you can see background sets, yeah, sets uh, because they're still up from... Mm -hmm. From Bronco Billy and the Bandit's Secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a 30-minute two-reel film and uh, made with black and white film on a hand crank camera. And uh, we edited it with a 1928 tabletop movieola and used silent film techniques. And uh, it was well, a fun film to make. Will there be a time where more people can see it? We're working on finishing the documentary about it, packaging it with... A Bronco Billy film from 1913 on a DVD. Oh, good. With some outtake material and maybe a photographic essay as well. Great. Well, uh, David, this has been a really wonderful interview. I uh, I really appreciate you diving deep into this SNA thing. I mean, this is amazing what this museum does. When did it start? 2004. You started. You turned this back into a Nickel an original Nickelodeon. Yeah, we moved in in 2004. Started showing silent movies in January of 2005, every Saturday night. So it was live piano music. I mean, Chaplin fans would just love love this museum. But outside of the the Chaplin world, you know, you come in and you get all this Charlie history, but you also get a history of Bronco Billy and uh, George Spohr and Ben Turpin and Edna Proviance, and the Snakeville comedies. It's a gateway to a larger world that Charlie was a part of for a while, but uh, you really learn, you get a more broad history of, of everything. And uh, I, I continued success at the SNA Museum, and it's getting better and better as it goes along, and more people are discovering what they do here at this museum. So, David, thank you very much for cool. being here, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you.